On this Thursday night, another mission to stop sexual misconduct in Canada's military. The latest review, who will conduct it, what will it cover, and what's being promised this time? I'm truly sorry. Fresh injection of hope, promising news about Canada's vaccine rollout. A potential solution ignored, why some long-term care homes were not held accountable for their failures. Plus, they are loud and messy. I've been squirted by these things. Trillions of these creepy crawlers are emerging. A story that could bug you. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. After decades of failing to deal with allegations of sexual misconduct in the military, allegations that now reach the highest levels, there is another plan to root it out and stop it. Louise Arabour, former Supreme Court Justice and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, will lead an independent external review of the military's handling of sexual harassment and misconduct. It is the second review in six years. Today, as Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan announced it, he also apologized. To every member in the Canadian Armed Forces, to every person in the Department of National Defence who has been affected by sexual harassment and violence and felt that we were not there to support you, I'm truly sorry. For too long, critics say the military has protected its own. Sajjan says the focus needs to shift to those who have experienced misconduct and harassment, including a reporting system outside the chain of command. It is not a new idea. It's just never been implemented before. The military has also promoted a woman to a new role to oversee conduct and professionalism. It's not clear, though, what power she actually has. After the last review, General Vance himself promised changes. He is now under investigation himself. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has been driving the coverage on this story and has our top story tonight. In early February, allegations of sexual misconduct against the military's former top soldier, General Jonathan Vance, stunned the country and the forces. That single story triggered an avalanche, a reckoning in the military as victims came forward. The hardest part is knowing there's nowhere to turn to. We don't have a seat at the table. We're not getting justice. The Liberal government has come under fire. The Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and the Defence Minister were both aware of allegations against Vance in 2018. The self-styled feminist government failed to implement key recommendations from the landmark Deschamps report into military misconduct in 2015. It all made Madame Louise Arbour dubious of the value of yet another report when the government came calling. My first reaction was, well, just as Deschamps was there, when was it? It seemed just a few years ago. <laughs> How many times is it going to take to look at this? Ultimately, Madame Arbour concluded a renewed and broader review of military sexual misconduct was needed. Arbour says trust has been undermined in the forces and operational effectiveness is at risk. Maybe six years later, this might be the opportunity to actually put it right. Her review will look into the forces promotion system that enabled toxic leadership. The military justice system victims say has failed them and an external independent reporting mechanism outside the chain of command. We have heard you, we have listened, and we are taking action. The promised changes include a culture czar who will review the armed forces policies, but there's little detail on what newly minted Lieutenant General Carignan will do. Um, what powers that will be determined in the next uh, few weeks as we are confirming and working uh, a clear mandate? Victims of military sexual assault, like Leah West, say the government has known about the need for external reporting for years, and it should have been announced today. It should have happened then. It has not. And that is a failure, I think, of leadership on behalf of the Minister of National Defence and of the, of the Trudeau government. Mercedes, you broke the story about sexual misconduct allegations against the former Chief of the Defence Staff, General Jonathan Vance. That is, in large part, what spurred this renewed focus on what is a long-standing problem in the military. Is this new external review going to look at the allegations against Vance? 
Donna, it will not look at the allegations against Vance, and I have that directly from Madame Arbour herself when I talked to her this afternoon. She said she will be looking at systemic issues in culture, but not specific cases. That leaves that case in the hands of military police and the military justice system, areas that victims have raised concerns about as to whether or not the system could lay charges or could actually carry out a trial if those charges are laid. Ultimately, victims remain skeptical, but hopeful, Donna. Okay, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. Now, to news about COVID-19 vaccines. Here is where Canada is at with the rollout. 31.5% of Canadians have now received at least one dose. That is more than 11.9 million people. Just 2.9% of Canadians, though, are fully vaccinated with two shots. The vaccine rollout is gaining momentum. Today, Canada's two largest provinces announced everyone 18 years and older will have access to their first dose within the next month. It's encouraging news with the risk of infection at its highest point right now. And as Heather Urex West reports, unvaccinated essential workers are wondering if it's finally their turn. For workers at the Cargill Meat Packing Plant in High River, Alberta, the last year has been tough. I would get scared very, very often, and I don't want to see my entire family go down with something just because of the place that I work. Last spring, nearly half of the plant's 2,200 workers became ill with COVID-19. Since then, there have been several more smaller outbreaks here too. It's why this long-awaited vaccine clinic means so much. I'm going to get vaccinated today, and we're all going to get vaccinated today. Today is going to be a good day. But across Canada, many essential workers are still waiting for their turn to be called. Teachers and childcare providers and construction workers and postal workers and all of these essential uh, workers who are reaching out and saying that they're desperate and they're not on the list. That's because outside of BC, vaccine priority has mainly come with age. But very soon, Canada's two largest provinces believe they'll have enough vaccine for everyone. We have announced that we are opening tomorrow the uh, the the vaccination for the population in general. Based on current supply projections, the Quebec government expects the vaccine will be made available to everyone 18 and older by May 14th, May 24th in Ontario. This is exciting news. The way out of the pandemic is vaccines and the light at the end of the tunnel grows brighter every day. The provincial promise made possible by the increases in supply. Starting next week, Canada will receive 2 million weekly doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, ramping up to 2.4 million a week in June, while 300,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson are in the process of thawing out before they're distributed. Once shipments are repackaged, deliveries will start to provinces, and this is expected at the beginning of next week. Each dose representing priceless peace of mind, protection after so many months living in fear. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The family of a Quebec woman who developed rare blood clots and died after receiving the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is urging others to watch for symptoms and seek medical treatment right away. 54-year-old Francine Boyer died on April 23rd, two weeks after receiving the first AstraZeneca dose. In a statement written in French, her family says she experienced headaches and fatigue in the days after the vaccine and was taken to the nearest hospital. Her condition deteriorated and she was transferred to the Montreal Neurological Hospital Institute. She died of cerebral thrombosis. She is the only person in Canada known to have died as a result of a COVID vaccine. Six other Canadians have been treated for blood clots. The blood clots are extremely rare events. The risk of getting a blood clot from a COVID-19 infection is about 10 times greater than getting a blood clot from the vaccine. There is some cautious optimism in Ontario. New modeling shows the third wave is now cresting because of the latest public health restrictions and more vaccinations. Though case numbers are dropping faster than was originally projected, they are nowhere near as low as they need to be. The modeling shows if transmission levels remained where they are today, daily case numbers in Ontario would still be above 2,000 new infections per day by the end of May. And there would still be the potential for cases to rise again, starting a fourth wave. Many countries and jurisdictions have been here before. It's tempting to relax when the numbers start to turn your way, but it will not work. This is the time to commit to getting them down. 
Well, tomorrow is the deadline for a commission looking into what went wrong in Ontario long-term care homes during the pandemic to issue its report to government. Among its interim findings, a ministry inspection system that lacks enforcement and verification that violations are actually addressed. The same issues with inspections were highlighted yesterday in Ontario's Auditor General report. As Carolyn Jarvis reports, a potential solution was on the table before COVID-19 struck, but was never used. Inspectors knew that this would be a problem someday, and it happened. Watching the death toll rise as care homes buckled under the weight of COVID-19 has been agonizing for this former long-term care home inspector, whose identity we've agreed to conceal because they still work in the industry. It's been absolutely devastating because you knew that these problems were inherent and that the homes were not prepared, and they were not prepared to respond adequately to it. More than 3,700 residents of long-term care homes in Ontario have died since COVID struck. Some homes with long lists of inspection violations, both before and during the pandemic. You look at things like inspections that have been done in the midst of outbreaks. They've shown gross deficiencies, but how has that information been acted upon and how have the inspectors gone back in a timely manner to ensure that those deficiencies were rectified so that we're protecting the residents? Part of the reason little was done, some speculate, is that penalties are rarely imposed and there are no financial consequences. Inspectors don't have a lot of teeth. I can tell you to do something and you can do the bare minimum to meet it, but there's no penalty towards it. Under the previous Liberal provincial government, a bill was passed to give inspectors the power to issue an administrative penalty. But an election was called and it was never enacted. Doug Ford's provincial government could have moved forward with the law, but says it wanted to do more consultation. And so fines never happened. We say that the government has an oversight mechanism that failed miserably long before COVID. Daryl Singer is one of the lawyers behind a proposed class action lawsuit against dozens of long-term care homes in Ontario where outbreaks occurred. It alleges the provincial government is also liable for a lack of enforcement. And what would happen if the police were pulling people over, giving speeding tickets, but there was no follow-up? Would you pay your ticket? No, of course you wouldn't. And that's exactly what's happened with the nursing homes. There's no consequence. The government says it's still considering other enforcement options. And in the meantime, will continue to use management orders to help homes in need. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News, Toronto. We'll have more on our investigation into long-term care homes in Ontario and whether they heeded warnings this Saturday at 7 on The New Reality, right here on Global. The federal government is giving emergency aid to another Canadian airline. It has agreed to give Air Transat up to $700 million in repayable loans. As a condition, nearly half of the money will be used to refund travelers for cancelled flights. Reimbursements for customers who were scheduled to leave on or after February 1st of 2020 are expected to begin immediately. Air Transat will also issue Ottawa 13 million warrants for the purchase of company shares at $4.50 each. The loan is from the same program that was used earlier this month to help Air Canada. The world's worst COVID-19 outbreak with no relief in sight. Coming up, the tragedy in India's hospitals and streets. It wasn't long ago India thought it had come through the pandemic relatively unscathed. Now people are dying in their homes and other people are begging to be treated inside overflowing hospitals. Loved ones are doing anything they can to try and save those who are fighting to breathe. International aid is arriving in the country, but as Crystal Gamansing explains, it won't be enough to change what's happening right now. And a warning, you may find some of the images in her story disturbing. At this hospital in Delhi, there's no physical distancing, no special barrier separating COVID-19 patients, and no certainty treatment will continue. You know, this oxygen can be switched off at any time if it is not available. Then what, what will I do? I will just see him dying in front of me. Thursday saw the highest daily death toll since the start of the pandemic, and those are only the officially registered deaths. One ICU doctor says what he is witnessing in his hospital is beyond a crisis. They are dying on the way to the hospital because they are going from hospital to hospital trying to find a bed. That's no way to treat our citizens. Please save her. Please save her. Please save her. Desperate cries can be heard inside hospitals and out on the streets. 
every single day I hear my friends, family uh, getting infected and people losing their, my, you know, numbers and names now. Fatima Singh's younger sister tested positive, an added stressor for Singh as she works to organize Red Cross efforts on the ground. Currently, they are ensuring, uh, you know, working closely with the local administration, working in ambulance services and blood services, first aid, oxygen supplies. Supplies are arriving daily, but the need is immense. India is the second most populous nation and the virus is raging. Different cities and regions have lockdowns such as Delhi and many people are staying home. Others have no choice. They're needed at work. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Still ahead, President Biden's bold promises to transform America. U.S. President Joe Biden has touched down in Atlanta to sell the bold plans he laid out in last night's speech to Congress. Biden said trickle-down economics has never worked and that the economy has to grow from the bottom and middle out. Hello, Georgia and the other county back there. I love you. A lot of folks out here tonight. If you ever wonder if elections make a difference, just remember... What you did here in Georgia when you elected Ossoff and Warnock, you began to change the environment. The president is proposing trillions in new spending and expansive new social programs. Jackson Prosco reports on Biden's plans and whether he can deliver them. The president of the United States. Believing this is the moment America is ready for change, President Joe Biden outlined an unprecedented plan to remake the country. We have to prove democracy still works, that our government still works, and we can deliver for our people. Using his slim, progressive majority in Congress, Biden wants to expand the role of government, calling for $6 trillion in new spending, paid for with tax hikes on the super-rich, proposing things rarely spoken of in the U.S., like universal pre-kindergarten, paid leave, and free tuition at community colleges. Trickle-down economics has never worked. And it's time to grow the economy from the bottom and the middle out. Republicans who supported big deficits during the Trump years are now clutching their wallets, claiming the proposals are too expensive or too alarming. At least one appeared to doze off during Biden's address. Joe is deliberately being boring, but the substance of what he's saying is radical. I think that uh, by being more mild-mannered uh, than his predecessor, it's not only what the American people want, but it also helps to lower uh, the volume on Capitol Hill and helps people to work together. Not that Biden needs to work with anyone. He seems to be daring his opponents to vote against the things he believes voters want. The president recently signed a $2 trillion COVID relief bill. Not a single Republican voted for it. Polls show two-thirds of Americans approve the bill. When they talk about unity, they're talking about delivering for the American people writ large. They're not talking necessarily about playing nicely with the Republicans in Congress if they can't get what they want. Biden's own approval rating sits at 57 percent, less popular than Obama at 100 days, far more popular than Trump ever was, but perhaps popular enough to make these once-in-a-generation changes. Thank you. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on Russia and said there will be consequences if jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny dies in prison. Today, he appeared in a court hearing by video link, the first time he's been seen since his three-week hunger strike. Looking gaunt, Navalny denounced the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, as an emperor with no clothes. The judge upheld Navalny's conviction for defamation. He was jailed in February in a separate case for breaking parole. The 44-year-old went on a hunger strike to demand access to his own doctors. He says his supporters say the charges are trumped up and they accuse Putin of being behind an attempt to poison him to death. Bug party next. The noisy species emerging for a mass gathering. Something record-breaking is expected to emerge from underground this year. After 17 years spent buried in dirt, trillions of cicadas will surface en masse. Cicadas won't hurt you, they don't sting, and they're not venomous. 
but they have other ways of making their presence felt and heard, as Mike Drolet explains. If you have a phobia of bugs, you may want to close your eyes. Because after 17 years, the periodical family of cicadas known as Brood 10 have begun to emerge from the ground like the undead in a horror movie. Some call it one of the seven wonders of the insect world. Biologist Gene Kritsky, who wrote the actual book on Brood 10, is in cicada heaven. They are rather attractive, but if you got to remember, they got me tenure, so <laughs> I'm somewhat biased. For the next four to six weeks, he'll be tracking their emergence with the help of an app called Cicada Safari. Finding them won't be a problem. They number in the billions. And their mating call can be louder than a jet engine. And then there's the ick factor. They shed their husks, among other things. They're piercing sucking insects so they can, and they feed on tree roots. Now, I have seen males squirt. I've been squirted by these things. Kritsky describes it like standing in a light rain. But unless you're an entomologist specifically studying cicada rain, it's best to avoid it. The good news is brood 10 will appear only in the US. Canada has its own periodical and annual broods. They're significantly smaller and quieter, but no less interesting. For the most part, people are, I won't say encouraged, more ambivalent about insects, <laughs> and uh, if not you know, direct animosity. So to have something that, that engages them in a, in a positive way, I think is, is, a, is a really good thing. Cicadas might not be for everyone, but there's no point in complaining about Brood 10. Who's going to hear you? Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Put me in the ambivalent category. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Air Canada is Soli Cove near Five Islands, Nova Scotia. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on Saturday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.